In this video, which is part one of two, we will discuss the types of detailed information and data that are needed for a landscape and wildlife population model to run effectively. Although computers are an essential piece of modern technology that has allowed us to develop sophisticated simulation models, we don't just develop and run models for the sake of working on a computer. As this gentleman with a heavy cloud above his head reminds us, our work with models starts conceptually within our minds and with important questions that need answers. By asking, what are the sustainable harvest management options for this wildlife population, and what information do I need to evaluate these options? We set the stage by asking an important question, which will require a systematic evaluation of the best available information and data. Only then should we start to consider which computer models could be used to help us think, learn, and communicate as a way of addressing the problems. For this example, the gentleman selected a model named ALSEES to simultaneously track landscape changes due to natural disturbances and human land uses, as well as simulating the dynamics of wildlife populations. Our example study area is in northeast Yukon. We chose this area because it is remote and has little to no human footprint, so our modeling assumptions and data needs were reduced. The area was about 12,000 square kilometers, which is roughly equivalent to an area 110 kilometers by 110 kilometers. The species we were interested in modeling was moose, but the area is also home to other large mammals like caribou and doll sheep and grizzly bear. The study area occurs within the Peel River watershed and can be described generally as large mountain ranges with large open valleys. Average elevation in the study area was about 1,500 to 8,000 feet above sea level, which in metric is about 460 to 2,400 meters above sea level. And there is no road access, which again highlights that the area is remote. If you think back to video 1.2, you will recall that we introduced the concept of a bathtub or a stock and flow model to help us understand why wildlife populations change over time. If we apply the concept that a population increases through the number of animals born into the population and equate that to inflows in the stock and flow model, we can group many of the information needs of the model as data that directly or indirectly influence productivity of the population. For example, from a habitat perspective, information on the size and habitat composition of the study area set the basis for the quantity and quality of the environment that the wildlife population occupies. Natural disturbances like fire, insects, and climate also have very important effects on maintaining different amounts of young and old forest and plant communities, which influences productivity of a wildlife population. With respect to the wildlife population, some of the key demographic characteristics that most directly influence productivity are population age and sex structure. Direct estimates of reproductive performance are also important to consider. For example, how many females are reproducing and how often are they reproducing? When we apply the concept that a population decreases through outflows or the number of animals that die in the population, we can group information needs of the model as data that directly or indirectly influence mortality of the population. An important habitat-related factor that may indirectly affect wildlife mortality rates is land use. The trajectories or extent and rate of growth in land use activities associated with mining, forestry, energy, urban residential and recreational expansion may lead to disturbance or loss of habitat. Although land use is listed here under the wildlife mortality heading, it is important to recognize that habitat change and human land use can have both positive and negative indirect effects to wildlife productivity and mortality. To understand broad drivers of wildlife mortality, it is important to quantify or estimate natural rates of mortality due to predation, winter kill, disease, and other causes. And it is vital to understand not only mortalities from harvesting, but also the mortalities from poaching, vehicle collisions, and human wildlife conflicts, to name a few. To understand the quantity and quality of habitat in the study area, we used a computer mapping program called the Geographic Information System, or GIS for short, 
to estimate the area for each of up to 20 landscape or habitat types. Fortunately, an ecosystem mapping project for the Peel River watershed was done recently, so there was very good, reliable mapping information for the study area. The model also required information on the amount of human footprint within the study area. So an obvious question is, what is meant here by a human footprint? A human footprint is a feature on the landscape that occupies a certain amount of space and was created by people. Some examples that come to mind are major roads, minor roads, trails, seismic lines, towns, cities, acreages, pipeline and transmission line right-of-ways, well pads, surface mines, and agriculture. Human footprints can be permanent features, or they can be reclaimed over time. However, since the study area was remote, there was virtually no human footprint, so it was not included in our example. Because wildlife species often use forested habitats differently, depending on whether the forest is young, mature, or old, the forest age class structure is another important piece of information that is used in the model. For this exercise, we assumed an even age class structure, which meant that the forests had the same area of young, mature, and old stands. Once we collected the baseline information in the landscape through the GIS program, we ranked the quality of the landscape or habitat types according to the wildlife species we were interested in modeling. For most studies, we would also rank the quality of the footprint types as habitat to wildlife. But as mentioned previously, we assumed that there was no human footprint in our study area. This figure shows the 20 general landscape types within our study area. For example, you can see representative pictures of high elevation coniferous forest, herbaceous wetland, wetland forests, and large rivers. Natural disturbances such as fire and insect outbreaks are fundamentally important in the ecology of boreal forests. Fires and insect outbreaks may kill large areas of trees, but in so doing they stimulate the forest to rejuvenate itself, starting again from young seedlings and shrubs. The result is a rich mosaic of forested land that is a mix of different patch sizes with varying species composition and age classes of trees. This forested patchwork in turn provides habitat for wildlife. Consequently, for a landscape model to simulate forested habitat changes over time, it needs to have basic information on how frequently a forested area will burn. This information describing the fire cycle is called the fire return interval, and for the Northeast Yukon study area, the return interval was estimated to be about 100 years. For the purposes of demonstrating the wildlife population model, we made the simple assumption that insect outbreaks would not be simulated. Information on meteorology, i.e. seasonal weather patterns such as precipitation, snowpack, and temperature, were also summarized and entered into the model. Climate change, however, was not considered. Because the study area we selected was remote and had virtually no human footprint, human land uses were not entered into this basic landscape and population model. Thank you for your interest. Please view video 3.2, which is the second part of this video on building a landscape and wildlife population model. In video 3.2, we will explore the wildlife aspect of the model in more detail.